Murat. I wanted to give a quick update on what we've been working on in really marrying this sort of traditional health monitoring also with uh, sort of multi-scale materials characterization. Uh, but of course, again, the focus on, in this case, infrastructural materials and systems. Uh, so essentially, what I would like to cover is my journey more or less from going from being sort of a traditional civil engineer to really uh, developing new capabilities and new methods in neutron scattering and imaging, which I think have incredible relevance for the civil engineering industry. It's just still a very nascent field and in a way not well known. So one of my jobs is to beat the drum to, to introduce everyone to these capabilities so you know what's out there in case you ever run into a problem uh, that requires it. So again, as a quick uh, update uh, or as a quick retrospect, I started at Columbia in 2000. I took over this lab in 2007. It didn't quite look this spiffy back then. Um, it, this is a strength of materials and standardized testing laboratory. So it has similar, uh, well, similar capabilities. It's smaller than the ATH lab, but again, it has very typical scope of doing emergency testing, uh, forensic work uh, and standardized testing. Uh, became its director in 2017. Uh, but again, I will also mostly focus on work that we've done uh, in cooperation with various large national labs, which I use mostly as a source for neutrons and uh, sort of as a supporter of huge user facilities. Okay, so of course, my motivation comes from the fact that, especially in the, in the United States, I'm originally Swiss, so I know the state of infrastructure here. Uh, I know the state of infrastructure in the US. The US is slightly less optimal than here. Uh, this is actually a picture from a Williamsburg structural member uh, here on the right. Uh, so this is on the Williamsburg Bridge. Uh, this was back in the 1970s, early 80s, when they noticed when they were doing the inspection that the structural member uh, suffered from a severe case of not being there anymore, um, and that that was going to be a problem. And really what this did is, and this hasn't changed much, uh, what this did was create this paradigm of irreplaceable infrastructure because this bridge was condemned by the city. And then very quickly, people noticed that if you lose a major suspension bridge or any type of transport link in a major urban area, that creates massive economic damage almost immediately. And replacing that structure itself is an incredible, almost insurmountable headache, right? Building parallel structures next to them, uh, is very complicated. You would have to condemn multiple city blocks, taking down a structure and then replacing it may take say five to eight years. So this is a major issue. And of course, just the motivation here is that today in the United States, 7.5% of structures are deficient and almost half have exceeded their design lives. Uh, so this is a major issue and just, uh, seeing the, uh, the bridge collapse in Maryland, right? There is an issue of having generally non-redundant structures. So we have structurally determined steel trusses. They're very common. Uh, and of course, large scale bridges also, which are aging. Uh, this is actually the same area of connection in largely present day. This is 2013. So in the US, this is considered an improvement. It's like, looks okay. There's steel now. So that's better than no steel. Uh, still not great. So again, the issue here is, and this paints the picture, right? This is the Williamsburg Bridge today. Uh, this has had about $1.2 billion of investment just to bring it to state of good repair under operation. So it's a massive effort, especially since this bridge cannot be taken heavily out of service. So you can do overnight work where you shut down the bridge that may be a weekend here or there, but you cannot shut down this bridge entirely because uh, you would cut off an entire neighborhood in Brooklyn from essentially uh, Manhattan where all the jobs are. So they replace them. Therefore, we have to be smart in uh, really understanding these systems. And that was essentially what motivated me to start working on or researching uh, the typical uh, suspension bridge structural form. This I don't have to explain to you, of course, but just so we know, you know, also in English, uh, the main suspension bridge cable, if you look at that, of course, it's an array, a parallel array, uh, in no way spun, it's just purely paralyzed and mechanically compacted array of five millimeter wires that are generally placed in hexagonal packing form. The wires themselves are round, right? But it's a 60 degree tessellation form. And then each spacing between these vertical suspenders that hold the deck way are called a panel. 
And then of course, this uh, clamp here is the cable band that just holds the, the cable together. It helps to compact the cable and it also provides a transfer point for the vertical loads for the suspenders. So if I look at this structural form, obviously, if I just think about failures, you know, these could be local failures, hopefully not yet global. If I have a wire break in a bridge cable, it occurs somewhere, right? My question then is, what is the safety factor of the bridge? Sort of when does when do these local failures become sort of observable from a global sense? When do they actually influence the strength of the bridge? And that for that we can define eta, uh, the stress transfer factor, which is essentially uh, just if you have a broken wire, of course, equilibrium dictates that broken wire at the fracture point has zero load. And at some point, it regains load through frictional transfer. Very basic concept, uh, very obvious. But of course, the question of that development length inside the bridge cable is actually non-trivial. Because then the question is, OK, so we have transfer. Uh, it's a, it's a well-packed system. Why, you know, over which distance does that wire actually regain strength? So in the limit, right, we have the two limits. If I say that development length is infinite, then I say, well, I'm being conservative. Uh, I just assume that that wire is dead. That's a very simple sort of residual strength calculation. Similarly, if I have a well-packed system, that development length may be on the order of centimeters. And then every wire can be broken right in a bridge. And that's similar to natural fiber rope. There is not a single fiber in a seesaw rope, for example, that spans the length of the rope. It's expected that there is friction transfer. The issue is that this length was never actually developed uh, or never actually experimentally measured. It was simply a committee decision made uh, when the Williamsburg report was written in 1988, where a committee said, nah, we'll say it's two panels. Seems reasonable. And that was it. And at that point, that was written. Somebody said something. And after that, everyone said, well, they said two panels. But we actually did not have any true experimental work. They did some minor. Uh, retraction measurements where they actually cut a few wires on a backspan in the Williamsburg Bridge, but that backspan did not have standard cable bands. It was not representative, and it was just literally three or four wires they snipped before the bridge owner yelled at them. So it's not a true experiment, but you know, gave them some idea. Now, how do we measure uh, friction systems? This is one of the more challenging issues, right? Because normally if you start doing direct measurement in a friction system, you will have some mechanical interference with the actual friction mechanism. So one pathway is to use neutrons. And I'll explain the method in a second, but of course the, the locations where one would do this in the United States would either be at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, uh, Lujan uh, Center, or at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory's uh, spallation neutron source or high flux isotope reactor. In Switzerland, you would do this at the Pauschedel Institute uh, in Finnegan. So what can neutrons do? Well, neutrons are amazing for many reasons. Uh, many people are familiar with x-rays, right? If you get an x-ray tomogram, sort of you've, you've heard of this, right? If you have a lung problem, whatever it may be, uh, you can get a nice 3D image uh, from uh, using x-rays. X-rays are photons. So photons... Uh, are very good at transmitting through uh, low Z number elements, but they generally get obviously uh, absorbed by high Z number. So by that, I mean large atomic nucleus mass. So if you have you know, a lead jacket that you put on uh, when you're at the dentist, you get your X-ray, that lead jacket will absorb all of the X-rays within a few microns of the material. Neutrons, on the other hand, are a subatomic particle with mass, and they can actually penetrate through uh, materials, such as engineering materials, they can go through about uh, 15 centimeters of aluminum, they can go through about 15 millimeters of steel. So now we have a penetrating capability that also does not alter the system mechanically. So if you have high energy x-rays from a light source, they will heat up the material at some point, and they will, if you're doing biological imaging, etc., you will burn your sample relatively quickly. Neutrons are just by coincidence, the energy range that we use are room temperature. So even assuming this, these few little subatomic particles actually did cause an uh, energy change, we don't have a thermal change because they're actually the same temperature as the material. Um, and they also don't cause any stresses and strains. So from our standpoint, other than the fact that they create unstable isotopes in the material, 
And so the, whatever you're testing is mildly radioactive when you're done. From a mechanic standpoint, it's completely oblivious to our measurement. And that's relatively amazing. So what we do here now is we take our sample. We have an incoming neutron beam here. We put our sample in. Now the geometry is a function of actually the, the stress and strain state that we want to measure. Uh, and then from this point on, in a standard engineering materials diffractometer, we would have two sensors. These two bays are collimated. There's a lot of detail here, but essentially you have a gauge volume here, a 3D pixel array, so a voxel, where you get essentially two atomic lattice readings, which if you uh, put the system through two states, it's like having two strain gauges that are normal to each other inside the material. And you're reading only the elastic state. So that's important if you care about plastic strain. So essentially, if I take steel, right? So I take the body center cubic atomic lattice uh, unit cell, which is really what, uh, what uh, the ferrite phase is made out of uh, on the atomic scale. If I just shoot neutrons through it, a few neutrons, a few percent scatter, which means that they interact with the with the regular lattice uh, field and they shoot off into a direction. And then they actually create this diffraction pattern, which is very similar. It sort of acts and it acts like a multi-degree of freedom uh, PSD of a dynamic system. It looks the same, it acts the same. Uh, you know, in the end, all the tools we use to identify are essentially the same, right? So there's no, there's no voodoo here. It's just, we're using uh, essentially a, uh, PSD, which isn't a PSD, it's a diffraction pattern. It's a diffraction pattern generated through uh, atomic interaction. We run this through a uh, physics-informed identification algorithm called a Rietveld refinement. And from that, we get a lattice parameter. So essentially, we get the average atomic spacing of the ferrite lattice, or in the case of aluminum, be an FCC lattice, um, of that material in space. So now if I deform that same unit cell, I can essentially get another uh, diffraction pattern and the peaks move. So it's just like if you change the stiffness in your multi-degree freedom system. Right here, you're just actually changing the spacing of the lattice and your, uh, your diffraction pattern moves. From that, you get another set of lattice patterns and voila, we have strain, right? So this is how we can measure strain inside a material. And of course, we can also get derived error. So, this is an amazing tool because we can get, for example, residual stress fields and strain fields, measure them inside of a solid. So we can get an aluminum blob, 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, and ask ourselves, what are the elastic strain differentials within that? What is the gradient of the strains? That's literally a trivial measurement for this method. <clears throat> so what did we do? Well, we took a sample, in this case, a seven wire unit cell, so we took seven steel wires, ASTM A586 wires, so it has about a strength of 1.7 gigapascal. And we broke the center wire at a point here, placed a clamp that more or less stimulates a cable band. So the clamp is made out of aluminum, so it's very beefy. It looks a little comical, but that's because the aluminum allows us to actually shoot neutrons through it without any major interference. In neutrons, uh, aluminum is considered a window. So most, if you build a, a hot cell or a cold cell, you'll actually build it out of aluminum because the neutrons essentially don't care. They jump right through them. So if you look at a real cable band, this is essentially an up-down clamp. So mechanically, our little silly aluminum clamp actually mimics the, the real cable band quite well. And then the idea was very simple. You would go through this wire, of course, here in the center wire, we know that it's unstressed because we have a free boundary condition. And then we just go through this clamp and we just see under various confinement conditions that we have, again, at this point estimated just through uh, just theoretical calculations, what kind of pickup do we get of that wire? So what is our development length? Is it on the order of meters? Is it on the order of centimeters? Is it on the order of millimeters? So we stuck this whole thing into a beam line. So this is the, the Vulcan beam line in Oak Ridge National Lab. You can see here, the snout right here is actually where the neutrons come in at 45 degrees. And you see our sample there. <clears throat> the snout comes off of a one kilometer long uh, particle accelerator. So 
our voxel where we measure actually remains space invariant. We just move the sample into the voxel, right? Because it's easier to move a 10 kilo sample than a particle accelerator. Um, so then, and we ran this sample both at Oak Ridge and Los Alamos. And you can see here, this here, first of all, this is just the, our unclamped uh, normal. You can see that there's a little bit of that uh, elastic strain in the wire. The second we actually tighten the clamp, we get a beta of essentially one at the far end of the clamp here, 0.9. So that's pretty amazing. So within a matter of about 10 centimeters, we get full load pickup at the expected full clamping tightness uh, of the system. But this is where we said, well, this is all very nice, right? But it sort of opens the next question of uncertainty, which is what is our what does our what do our packing mechanics look like in this system, right? Because it's a it's it's technically a well-ordered packed uh, system with these five millimeter wires. But I actually don't know what the normal force is, right? I can calculate a friction coefficient because I know my normal force here because I have the full picture and I have my length. So this is almost the sort of an undergraduate mechanics problem. But the question is, in a large cable, how does the stress transfer? If I have, say, you know, a hoop stress that actually causes compression, how do those wires actually interact with each other? So that was a big question. Uh, now. Heim Weissman and Arturo Montoya many years ago, they said, well, this is easy. I'm a finite elements guy. I'll just assume that this is essentially a monolith and I can just use the Buskinesque trip, uh, distribution, which is you know, an analytical solution of, uh, of the stress distribution of a concentrated force on an infinite half space. Very elegant, it's beautiful, use an analytical solution. Of course, it ignores one minor issue, which is that this is not a monolith, this is actually a packed system of wires. Right. And that packing system turns out to be quite uh, not well behaved. So we said, well, let's find out what these forces are. So we built two models. We built a 19 wire, uh, later a 61 wire strand. Again, clamped it. This time we didn't care about longitudinal forces. We just wanted to see how these wires arranged and how the forces actually transferred through the wires, just to understand sort of how they react with their neighbors. So first of all, of course, before you start a uh, model like this, we did a small finite element model just to understand what the heck we were doing. And because these aluminum clamps, unfortunately, because they are aluminum and they have to be aluminum for us to be able to see uh, inside the, the cable system. Um, and here I should say also the wires are aluminum because this, this is too big to do in steel, even with neutrons. The aluminum clamps are relatively compliant, so they do squeeze uh, the wires at the edges here. We were aware of that. We said, okay, we're ready for this. This here is epsilon kk because we only measured two directions, which you could call principal, but they're not necessarily principal because they're blind actually to shear. So we just have two orthogonal stress directions. And if you look at the uh, epsilon kk, the first strain invariant of the actual uh, data, we see a very unwell behaved system, right? We see wires that are essentially unstressed transversely. So if I went to the matrix and pulled this wire out, we just go, it's come out, right? Zero uh, friction transfer. That's a problem, right? If that wire fails, it's development length, because again, I'm just looking at this in 2D. I don't understand the stochastics in the third dimension, but at least in 2D, this looks pretty bad. So if I happen to break this one, I'm probably okay. If I break this one, I'm in trouble. So when we first looked at this data, as we were publishing it, of course, people said, well, maybe you're just, your measurements suck. Maybe this is just, you know, bad data, um, which is, is a fair challenge. So we said, well, let's think about this. Why would this system be so chaotic? Um, and we came to the realization relatively quickly that, of course, in an array such as this, you are exactly packing steel. So your stiffness is incredibly high once it's tightly packed. And the system is incredibly sort of uh, open to, if you have a dimensional uh, incongruity between wire diameters, then that matrix, because it is so tight and it's efficient packing regime, will actually get disturbed massively. So we just did a quick finite element run where we undersized one wire in the full boundary conditions of this system and said, 
what happens if I undersize the center wire? I mean, this is obvious, just a single variable perturbation, but we just said, let's take that one. And we found out that if we undersize this wire in a steel system by 17 microns, that wire is free, right? And similarly, just uh, for aluminum, uh, if we undersized, uh, sorry, by 18 microns, if we undersized in aluminum matrix, it's more compliant. This is relatively simple, 35 microns, right? Now, here's the issue that the one sigma uh, deviation, standard deviation of, of wire diameters is exactly on the order of that free wire problem. So we know that we can sort of posit relatively confidently that imperfect diameters are probably causing this chaotic behavior. And it turns out as we're doing some follow-up to this, the wires, when it comes to, if you look at the statistics, the wires partially uh, sort of undulate in uh, in their diameter along the length due to uh, poor zinc coating. So the zinc coating itself has, and the intermetallics cause diameter variations. But what's even more disturbing is that there's also a monotonic increase in uh, diameter. So it's a non-stationary uh, stochastic process in that as they're cold drawn through a die, that die wears. So the wire starts small and then a kilometer later, it's larger, right? So that means that you have reliably small wires and reliably large wires on the cable length sort of uh, dimensional domain, which is bad, right? So then if you have a, a small wire that is reliably small, then if that wire breaks, you're in trouble. So just to answer the people who said, well, maybe you did bad measurements. Uh, we went back and they actually did the biggest uh, multi-body system ever measured in a neutron source, which is this 61 wire monster here. And again, we clamped it in this case, uh, well, 50 Newton meters was the torque on the, on the clamp, but essentially this is 50% maximum uh, theoretical optimal confinement strength. And we found that again, we actually saw these structures of certain wires that maintain this confinement uh, force and actually transfer it through the section. And if we doubled the force, structure remained, it just became more pronounced. So this first of all is a good proof that our data isn't crappy, right? We're actually reading something. We actually see an increase uh, of this structured regime where a few more wires are activated, but those that were already activated when we doubled the confinement, they took even more load. So again, here we have lazy wires and we have hardworking wires. And this is now obviously no longer a deterministic problem. So I should say that's, that's where we left this and said, great. If we want to do collapse analysis, we have some data here. We're still working on the actual collapse analysis uh, because now this is all a stochastic field and we have to be careful. Uh, but we said, well, there are other detractors to bridges, one being fire, right? And fire is an interesting problem. Um, I don't have to lecture to you, but you know we all know that fire is very well studied in some areas, especially in tunnels uh, and in structures in general, but when it comes to bridges, it's surprisingly ignored. And it's largely because it generally does not cause a major threat to life. But when we started working on uh, fire resiliency, we found out that structures uh, like major suspension bridges actually get hit by fires more often than one would think. So usually every bridge has one to two major vehicle fires a year. In fact, the Verrazano on one day had two independent vehicle fires. So completely statistically independent vehicle fires that happen in opposite lanes or opposing lanes on the same day at the same time to the point where the fire department could not respond because the other side was already on fire. So this, this is an issue. And of course it becomes very much of an issue if that fire is close to the main cables. So just a few pictures to point, uh, to sort of uh, motivate the point. This here is actually an intentional fire laid by someone in the, uh, in Istanbul, who then was trying to essentially set the bridge on fire. <clears throat> he did not succeed. Um, so we started this work a few years ago and we said, well, this is simple, but we, we're going to focus on the mechanics of the system to understand what happens to the bridge cable. We'll pull the uh, material properties of this steel, which has been used on suspension bridges for a hundred years from the literature. So we went to the literature, we said, well, NIST, which is the American INPA, they must have something somewhere. This is a piece of cake, ASTM, ASTM A586. Let's look at high temperature capabilities. Turns out nobody's ever done it. So NIST wrote a report on this and they used 
uh, a very unrelated metallurgy because they said no experimental data exists. So we sort of said, oh man, you know, I guess we'll start at step negative one and then we'll get to step positive one. So we started actually high temperature in situ and ex situ testing of, of the steel, very traditional strength of materials work. So we just did as one would expect in a universal testing machine with a furnace. We uh, first ran in situ tests where we would heat the metal up for just three minutes. And then we would run a typical test. And you can see because of the amount of cold working, the, the ultimate strength of the diversion wire is at 1.7 gigapascal. It's a very strong steel, right? But this is mostly due to the cold working uh, and the high dislocation density. The second, even at 300 degrees, you already have a reduction in strength. And then, you know, if you go to 400 degrees, 500 degrees, you lose massive capacity. So that means now we have this very dynamic system. If you have a bridge cable where wires start shedding load, they start creeping and they start deforming plastically. This creates a very complex system. And then we notice something else, which is post fire, if you just expose wire to say two minutes or 12 minutes of a fire, it's very reasonable for a bridge cable fire. It turns out that if you expose a wire just to two minutes or 600 degrees, you already lose considerable strength. And if you know we go lower, uh, we go much lower very quickly to the point where if you expose uh, a wire to you know, 800 degrees, as in the wire actually turns, uh, gets to that temperature, which is easy because a, a fuel fire is 1,500 degrees Celsius, right? You actually go back to your mild steel stress strain curve because the metallurgy is not that different from mild structural steel. It's purely the mechanical cold working that gave it that extra strength. So if you heat this stuff up and cool it back down, the steel may not actually appear uh, in any way damaged, but just the, the heat uh, effect you know, due to your heating will actually have transformed that steel into a material that now has 40% of the initial strength. And if the unfortunate truth is that the service load is somewhere here, right? So we are in the range where we can actually have material under the service load capacity. So that's where we said, well, from a material standpoint and from a sort of an atomistic multiscale standpoint, what is really happening in this wire? Do we have recrystallization or do we have dislocation density movement, and if you're in material science, you'll know what I'm talking about, but essentially when we cold work a wire, when we pull it through these small dies, we're deforming the, uh, the microstructure massively, right? We're actually lengthening uh, those grains and creating internal uh, strain potential, sort of intergranular strain potential, and that is what gives us this massive uh, plastic capacity. But the unfortunate thing is that that potential, just like any, uh, sort of potential energy state, if you have sufficient energy input for the system to rearrange, it will. And it does so very quickly, much more aggressively than a typical structural steel. And this is why we have to really uh, approach this not from a sort of a traditional standpoint uh, of just assuming, oh, you know, I know my code. If I read the code on fire, I know that an I-beam is okay if it looks okay. That is true for an I-beam, that is not true for these wires. And we proved that relatively quickly. And this is uh, my student who's still working on the paper. I need to send him another email and threaten to come back to NIST to make him finish it. Uh, but essentially, I've already had to do that once. You can see that only within a few minutes, we actually now, if you use, uh, in this case, peak narrowing uh, diffraction techniques, we can actually track the movement of those dislocations and the, the extinguishing of those dislocation uh, points inside the material. And the scary part is that Chemically, the steel has not changed. It is purely a microstructure evolution uh, on the sort of the atomic and the, the micro scale. So if we just plot this, uh, then we can actually get, you know, this here is a Williamson Hall plot in D space. This is sort of an inverse uh, space. So the point is that we actually see how we can extinguish or how quickly that uh, dislocation density uh, disappears if we have this steel that is just so aggressively cold work, uh, which is just generally dangerous. So let's just take this as a motivation say, okay, so hot, you know, bridge cable steel bat, right? So let's actually now understand how quickly we get that. And that was 
the second stage of this study where we said, well, again, now if you care about the thermal diffusivity of a continuous system, a lot of work has gone into tunnels, a lot of work has gone into, for example, heat shedding of structural steel members. But this is, again, a very unique setup here, right? Because we don't have a typical monolith. Again, we have this well-packed arrangement of wires. If we look at those wires sort of on, on the just centimeter scale, the wires are barely touching each other, right? Depending on how good your packing is, your contact surface for conduction transfer of heat is on the order of microns, somewhere between zero and 40 microns for wire to wire points. So we said, well, let's go back to NIST. We looked at what NIST said. We didn't believe NIST. So we said, let's do it ourselves. So we built a full scale bridge cable and we built the furnace and then instrumented this uh, bridge cable cross section. These are your, uh, your, your actual strands here with physical thermal couples. So we can actually measure temperature within the cross section. And then essentially here you can see the cross section. This here is essentially spatial plot of our diagonals where we have the densest uh, sensor array. And we heated the, the cable up to 437 degrees. Here you see the, the time trace, right? Came up, I mean, this is a very traditional sort of thermodynamics problem, but of course, big point here is that you need to essentially do this to understand what's going on because the devil is in the details. The compaction of this system is what drives everything. Right. There is the, the space between the strands, the space within the strands, you know, packing errors in, in full scale cables. This is what drives our diffusivity. So we ran it up for 36 hours and then we let it cool down. And it was quite surprising because you can see here, right, this is in Celsius. We actually still have temperatures after six hours of 100 degrees Celsius on this cable. So, so the diffusivity in the cross section is extremely low. You could still cook an egg on this thing after 60 hours from the start of the test, uh, or in this case, 24 hours after the end of active heating. And when we ran our FVM, so this is my student Jamari, when he did the identification uh, using an FVM model, we found that essentially NIST, so again, uh, US INFO assumed essentially a, a straight first and inverse uh, law of mixtures, and they assumed that uh, the effective radial cable conductivity was the order of 15 watts per meter per degree Celsius. And it turns out when we actually measured this, uh, it was here. It's an order of magnitude lower. And that is purely for the fact that uh, NIST assumed this model, which is not a realistic model for a bridge cable, right? This assumes that you have two materials that are intermixed with two different diffusivities, in this case, air, and steel. But the issue is that that is not that. Right here, you have con uh, contiguous transfer domains throughout that still allow you to, uh, to essentially conduct heat from one end of the cheese to the other, even though there are holes. Here, the, the geometry actually dominates the diffusivity because we have these tiny domains where we actually have conduction. Uh, now, this is important because remember, hot steel bad, right? So if I now take a fire, and again, a pool fire, so a, uh, uh, for example, a gasoline or a diesel pool fire, runs at about 1,500 degrees. So you have significant energy uh, pushing into the system. If I just take the cable as NIST assumed the diffusivity to be, then of course that cable is very good at transferring that heat on the outer edge into the monolith. So it acts more like an I-beam. But that is not the actual reality. The reality is that we have a tenth of that diffusivity, and then it's like putting a flame on an onion, right? It just fails to actually transfer through the layers and causes considerable local damage. So here now, instead of having a, a surface temperature sort of around here with some minor damage, we now suddenly have a surface temperature down here where we actually have wires breaking. And we tested this in the lab, and it does literally peel like an onion. So if you take a and a, a strand under tension, then you will just locally overheat the, the wires. They'll creep, they'll plastically deform, they'll break, and the, the wound will essentially open up. So it's just like a wound in a human. Um, at least it gives you sort of an understanding that something is happening. Problem is in a large array, that deformation may not actually cause failure. It may just cause 
redistribution of stress to the intact wires. For smaller strands, it's it's pretty visible. <clears throat> so that's that's more or less where we where I stood with this work while I was also, of course, tinkering with various toys in uh, the neutron world. And at some point, you know, somebody asked me if I wanted to have my own beamline. I thought that was insane because I'd be the only civil engineer ever to uh, to be a PI of a beamline. But I said, sure, why the heck not? So uh, right now we have two beamlines. One is in commissioning right now at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab. The other one is still on paper. So I'm the proud like father of a child that is still just on paper. Uh, but the idea here is that what we're trying to do is bring neutron imaging modalities into the engineering world and make it more accessible to really most of the engineering world. So that is not just physicists who speak this language. And I'll go through a few examples here to show you and to motivate the capabilities of these techniques and show you that really this is, especially neutron imaging is really the way of the future. And it is incredibly powerful for uh, to answer engineering questions. Now, if you've ever been in the beam line, essentially it consists of what's called a cave. So there's an area where the neutrons live. And of course that area is a high radiation area when the, the system is running. So in this case, we have a source over here and then we have various optics. And the reason we have these optics is that if you do an imaging beam line, unlike traditional diffraction before, the idea is that you want a large beam, but we are flux starved. So there's always the trade-off between the the time resolution and the spatial resolution of your measurement. So if you want to have relatively fast measurement where you're looking at maybe taking an image every few seconds or possibly even a fraction of a second, you get about four centimeter by four centimeter window. And then of course, the larger you get, the, the more you're capturing in space, but of course you're doing it in a slower fashion. Um, this is currently under design uh, now. What can I do with this data? And this is where we, it's incredibly important to recognize that unlike x-rays, if I use neutrons, they're much slower, but they carry with them an incredible amount of data and they do so simultaneously. So you get data across multiple length scales at the same time. You get frag edge imaging, which I'll describe in just a second, but essentially we get information on the atomic scale that is equivalent to traditional diffraction. So we understand lattice spacing, we understand phase fractions. So we get elemental composition as well as some elastic strain domain information. While at the same time, if we use gratings, which uh, Paul Institute here in uh, uh, Philippines is very good at. So Marco Schroeder there is one of the leaders. We can actually use grating interferometry, so combs, that are set, that are tuned to specific length scales that we care about. So again, here, the diffraction is occurring on the sort of on the length scale of atomic spacing. So on the angstrom level, right, 10, new, uh, 10 nanometers. If I now have porosity or some other defect that is regular in a system, so uh, void nucleation or other uh, porosity due to additive manufacturing, for example, I can actually use these gratings to then resolve that diffraction. And that scattering happens by Bragg's law at a smaller angle, so it's more difficult to capture, but I can also now capture that spatially. And then of course, I can also do just the tomogram. So I can also do direct imaging. So that will be equivalent to you getting, you know, an X-ray essentially at the doctor, that's a radiograph, right? It's a, uh, essentially just either your bone is white or your bone is black, depending on what your scale is for attenuation. The beauty is all of this happens at the same time. So this information all comes in hyperspectrally. So ragged imaging, if I now look at my transmission signal, so let's say if I looked at this phone and I cared about the battery inside this phone, if I did traditional diffraction, I would set my voxel, just one little cube somewhere in here, and I would look at that one voxel and get information. Now, instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to shoot a block of neutrons through this phone and then actually look at what arrives at the other end. So this is just, you know, if you look at the sort of, uh, at the applied math of this, right, the diffraction operator shoots off two to 3% of neutrons this way and we capture them and we get that PSD that I showed you in the beginning, that diffraction pattern. Well, now the rest of the transmitted signal is sort of the null space, right? But it's, they're highly related. 
So this is just if you took this and you took all the peaks that you know scattered off, you would get the incoming signal, right? So again, this then has nothing less than the same information where these are now my equivalent, these edges are my equivalent to fraction peaks. So they give me information on elemental phase fractions and again, strain. And now I can image, for example, phase information. So I can take this block, which is done by DOE, uh, and they actually 3D printed with uh, metal deposition at different temperatures. So they had a phase transformation in their metal. And then if you're now looking at the same radiograph uh, as a function of, uh, of these different frag groups, you can actually resolve different uh, phase fractions, for example, in the material. So now you have, you know, it's very much similar to this the hyperspectral image, right? You're, you're going along the neutron wavelength here. I won't get into the details with that, but it's essentially equivalent of an X-ray. If you just do an X-ray tomogram, it's essentially a black and white camera. Now we have color, so we can resolve the colors and that's the additional information. So that's one piece of the information. Neutrons also have phase. They have magnetic phase, they have spin. And depending on uh, the material, and again, this is something, it's just an observed phenomenon. If you ask a physicist, why does titanium have negative spin and copper have positive spin? They go, we just observe it. So we know it's true. You know, how do they interact? Heisenberg uncertainty, we don't know, we just observe it. Uh, it's on the atomic level, so we frankly just don't know. But because of this, we can actually now resolve elements directly just by looking at their, their spin inside the material. So again, additional uh, information where we can now start decomposing complex systems just by looking at an image. And beyond that, also with the gratings, we have a small angle scattering that can also resolve other small structures such as porosity. And I'll show a few examples in a second. <clears throat> so this is an example of, uh, this is not my work, but this is work on uh, Halcina BU's beamline at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab. This is actually a uh, research lithium ion cells. So very similar to what you have in your phone, right? It's flat, it's planar, it, it lends itself well to imaging. And what we can do now is you can actually uh, track the crystalline phases through ragage imaging, through just creating these voxel buckets, uh, and actually look at the lithiation, delithiation of the battery. You can also look at the stress in the cathode, right? And if I now do neutron grading interferometry on the same section, I can actually look at the porosity as well in, in the cathode. So the simultaneous multi-scale information is you know, incredibly powerful. And of course, for us, it's really about understanding now if you have structural materials, if you're in the aerospace domain, there's a lot of work happening now with 3D printed uh, uh, failure critical parts, right? So they may have porosity interior to the, to the print, uh, usually in the old days, right? If you're doing subtractive machining, most of your machining errors are on the outside. You may have some inclusions, uh, some hard alphas or something else that is sort of causing you trouble due to the base material, but generally your machining causes surface damage. Now we have in 3D printing, essentially the imperfections manifesting throughout the entire volume of the material, right, of the final part. So that's something that we need to also then be able to track and to understand. If I have interior porosity somewhere in the material because my deposition was bad, or of course what I can also do, which is what's happened here, is that you can actually functionally grade the porosity or change a phase of a material on the edge of a part, maybe harden it or soften it, whatever is needed. Um, and of course, we can also track residual stresses. This is now brand edge imaging of 3D printed parts and then look at how if we anneal them or if we do some uh, you know, post-damage assessment, we can understand if there was, in this case, maybe it's not manufacturing, maybe it's plastic overload, right? So if there is plastic overload, that will of course re result in sort of the opposite residual elastic strain, right? And that residual elastic strain, the beauty of that is that it's fully deconvoluted from the plastic strain when we use these methods, because these methods interrogate the interatomic lattice spacing of the material. So we only read elastic strain. So we automatically ignore the plastic component, which is sort of a luxury if you're doing work in uh, uh, materials testing. So the holy grail really for this is identifying fractures in the early stage. So this is where I try to sort of 
come back to uh, health monitoring and damage detection, right? This is some initial work that was done where you can actually see again with neutron grading interferometry. If you remember your uh, fracture mectanics, right? How does a uh, ductile material initiate fracture? Through void nucleation, right? It cavitates, it creates air pockets essentially. So sort of penny shaped voids are created or round voids are created in the material before really that material is even considered to be cracked, right? At this point, it's just sort of Swiss cheese on the inside. Well, if you have your NGI patterns, in this case, autocorrelation length of uh, two micrometers, tuned to that, whatever the material happens to cavitate at to what before it fractures, begin to detect the initiation point of those fractures before that crack really mechanically is a crack, right? It's not there yet. It's about to be, it doesn't know yet. We can actually catch it at that point. So when it comes to optimizing materials, this is incredibly powerful. Okay, so I'll conclude and I know I'll probably run a little over since we started late. Um, yeah. It's okay. Yeah, yeah, because we're, we're late. Actually. Yes, so of course, those, those are the methods, but now just to motivate those methods and to really show what we can do, but also to sort of create a warning because these methods are at this point really at the cutting edge of science. So we're still tinkering with actually having good confidence in, in the results. And that's very important. Physicists don't necessarily always appreciate that point. When they can measure something once, they write a paper and they're happy. Uh, if we have an engineering firm working with us, generally they want to make sure that we're you know, traceable and uh, we are truly confident in, in our errors. But uh, as we were working and tinkering with the various models, somebody gave me a call and said, well, you know, Adrian, um, turns out something, you know, terrible happened. If anyone saw GoldenEye, right? Essentially, GoldenEye happened to the Arecibo telescope in Puerto Rico. Now, this is a telescope built in 1962. It was the largest radio telescope until uh, a Larger ones built in China in 2016. It's a very old system, um, but it essentially sits in a natural sinkhole and has a, this giant reflector and actually has an active transmitter. So that is an active transmitter uh, for, for radar transmission. So this is not just a passive telescope. It can actually shoot out radar waves. That's why it's so heavy. Um, now, the system originally was just built as this passive hanging catenary. Uh, later, it was actually reinforced in 1973 and then again fully rebuilt in 1997. And this is where things took sort of an interesting turn because that entire uh, antenna array was just like one would expect astronomers and physicists kept adding more instruments to it. So it actually doubled in weight uh, within uh, its service life. So it had to be reinforced significantly. And another issue that it had was just due to Delta T thermal expansion between day and night, right? This system, it's a, just a catenary. The steel wires shorten during the night, right? Which actually lifts the antenna array, which is a problem because then your distance to your antenna array changes and your, your measured wavelengths, et cetera, are skewed. So what the operators did, and this was uh, the National Science Foundation who owns this, um, they actually tied the, the antenna down actively with and there were hydraulic actuators in those tie downs. As structural engineers, that doesn't sound like a great idea to be fighting thermal expansion actively, but okay, fine. Uh, that's what we did. Um, so if you look at now the, the the cable system, it's essentially what I spent you know way more time than I care to admit uh, studying. This is again, uh, this is actually helical wire as you can see here, but ultimately it's the same beast, right? This is high strength steel, ASTM 586, uh, terminated in these zinc uh, spelter sockets. So essentially, as the telescope was getting heavier, it went from 556 tons to 830 tons for the suspended antenna structure. And due to that, they actually added significant extra ropes. They also added the ropes eccentrically. So they sort of had to redesign the entire uh, carriage in the middle. And the reason they added the eccentric ropes was to make a torsionally uh, stable in Psi. Because before it had a sort of vibrational mode that it would just swing back and forth like this in the wind. So they tied it down, as you can see here, sort of eccentrically so that it would stabilize. Um, but then something bad happened. And then I should say the safety factors of those various ropes were on the order of two, which isn't 
great because it was an old system. Um, so if it was two in 19, you know, uh, 68, then I don't know where it is now. Um, pension, and then pension members started failing. That was obviously a bad sign. So in August, 2020, the first uh, cable failed. Uh, you can see down there. And that actually is one of the eccentric cables. So that actually caused the whole thing to sort of go kilter. So at this point we have some serious sort of P delta effects. And then another cable failed in November. And as they were carting up uh, new cables to replace all of this, the uh, suspension cables, this happened. You may have seen this of course on YouTube, but nonetheless, it's a very exciting thing to watch. Nobody was hurt because of those failures, the area was already uh, fully evacuated. And luckily, the consulting engineer was actually had hired a drone operator to inspect the structure. And as it turns out, just as this was failing, the drone operator was actually out and they were filming the connections, which is why we have the footage that you'll see in a second. Now, this is obviously not good, right? So NSF was not pleased with this outcome. They own this telescope. They always tell us to make, you know, to, I should not say this, but they tell us, you know, to make sure that we do good project controlling. And then this is what happened to their telescope. Now here, you can see already there's paint missing off this strand. So just keep your sort of focus on that connection. You can see their catastrophic pullout, right, of that socket. And then a very, fast drone operator, turn the camera and actually watch the, the whole thing come down. So this, you know, not, not just for, for the Odyssey for telescope, but in general, this was obviously somewhat disheartening because we had catastrophic failures of these uh, spelter sockets that are very common in construction. I mean, they're very common for uh, suspension bridges, cable stay bridges, uh, uh, standard suspension bridges, you know, marine applications, post-tensioning uh, systems. So this, this is a pretty common connection that we thought was reliable and now we had a problem. So the question was, of course, what caused this failure so we can understand if you know we have future issues that we should really watch out for in, in other old infrastructure and also new infrastructure. So one of the things we did is we actually sliced uh, essentially the small section that we, or the largest section that we could make uh, these sockets and then did some radiography on them and some tomography. Uh, to just look at the insides. So here's some cool looking tomography uh, with neutrons, of course. This could not be done with x-rays, right? Because the x-ray would die within 50 microns of, of the surface of this, <clears throat> or in most cases. So we had two slices. This is a slice of what is considered a good socket. And you can see the, the wires are relatively well broomed. Um, you don't see any sort of major artifacts other than the fact that you do see some pull out right here. There's actually an air gap behind these wires. That's an in indicator that since this socket is, is capped with liquid zinc, that zinc would have filled that space. So if you have interstitial space there, that means that these wires were actually pulling out. But now if you compare that, and here, of course, also, if you look at the tomogram, you'll see that we actually were able to fully capture these holes. And we also saw some delamination points and some bubbles along the way. So that was interesting. But of course, if you now compare this, with sort of the naughty socket, you can see that we have massive pull out of the outer wires, right? I mean, these are, this is on the order of centimeter, right? So we have plastic flow and actual like sort of interstitial delamination between the, the wire and the zinc. So this, this is an indicator of serious problems. You can also see that this block here is essentially pulled in, right? So the plastic flow in the system is, is tremendous. We also tried to do some Bragg-Edge imaging, but unfortunately, and now what I'm showing here is a, is a movie actually going through the frequencies, the energy states of the, of the neutrons. And you'll see these clouds here, here, right? These clouds are actually, <clears throat> we'll see it again in a second. These clouds are actually textures. So these are very large zinc crystals. And in retrospect, you should have thought of it. There you can see them really well. These very large zinc crystals are very common in zinc, right? If you look at zinc plated telephone poles or light poles, or you know, you're at the railroad, you'll see zinc grains that are the size of, you know, like easily a few centimeters, the size of your fist sometimes. 
problem is that those cause actual massive, they take bites out of your transmission signal because if I have my sample here and I have one zinc grain that happens to just diffract a bunch of my signal away at a certain frequency, then my brag edges actually have literally bites eaten out of them. So we're still working on building identification algorithms that can then denoise this data by using standards to put behind our, our sample so we can renormalize our reading so that we normalize the, the brag edges. That's still that's uh, still under development at this point. <clears throat> and this is really from the perspective of the engineer, because in physics, they'd be like, yeah, you got to meet you. You got a measurement. It's fun. Write a paper for us. We have to obviously make sure that it's, it, it has, you know, it holds water. Now, to, to finish the talk, really, uh, sort of the, the final spoiler was, how did this thing break? Well, it turns out it was a really banal error in initial manufacture, in initial fabrication, and very bad inspection, so visual inspection by poorly trained inspectors. <clears throat> because this is the bottom of the sculpture sockets, the inspectors actually went, ah, you know, there's, I mean, this is in inches, right? So this in this case, one and a half inches, so four centimeters of pull out. Okay, let me write that down. This in itself is already about 10 times beyond what's considered a progressive failure that is, should cause major alarm. Because what this is showing is that the, that zinc socket mass, which if, the uh, wires are perfectly broomed out, should be in a hydrostatic stress state, and therefore, right, uh, by merit of being in hydrostatic stress state, should not actually cause plastic flow. They are not, they're in a highly deviatoric stress state. And thus, they were slowly flowing out the bottom until they just failed catastrophically. So essentially, instead of having a well-broomed system, this casting core just sheared out over time. And that is how the telescope failed. So it was a very simple failure mechanism. And in the end, it was even documented, but the inspection essentially didn't result in the appropriate alarm. Um, so, you know, lessons learned, <laughs> visual inspection is, is faulty at best, but uh, make sure you train your inspectors. And that does, that concludes my talk today. So I hope it was, you know, sort of an informative spattering of uh, what we're doing these days. And of course, one of the reasons really I'm here is just my, one of my main motivations is to show a little bit of what neutrons can do in infrastructure and then try to find people interested in actually bringing their problems, you know, to us so we can collaborate and, you know, get a multi-scale understanding. So thank you. Thank you very much. And sorry for the technical details.